we all understand quite well that entrepreneurship is what is going to create jobs for the future in India and specifically startups. And I'm very glad that uh, the reach out is happening today so that you know we can get the views of the public and really understand what is important for everybody and try and implement it in the government because at the end of the day, youth is what is going to drive India and it is very important to hence support entrepreneurship in India and startups as well. No, I think it's an excellent initiative, uh, such informal chat conversation, uh, listening to mass group of people about uh, startups and entrepreneurs, I think will go a long way in giving confidence to people that uh, people who are in power are listening. Thank you for inviting me here. I've come here more as a listener. Uh, I'm not a technical expert. I've come here to listen to you, to get a sense of what you're feeling and how we can work together to make entrepreneurship easier uh, to help you build startups. I mean, I'm happy to take whatever questions you'd like to throw at me. Um, I think you'll, you'll, be, you'll be taking care of that aspect. Uh, I'm pretty excited to be here, so let's get moving. My question to you is, I'll read it out, please. When I signed up for today's session, many people told me that why do I associate politics with work? However, startups and non-profit organizations like ours should be interacting more with politics and government. And it should not be a bad perception. How will you change this perception? How will you motivate startups and people who currently do not believe in politicians and that they are there to help them and prove them otherwise? Thank you. Do you, do you have politics at work? Uh, I have politics in, at in, home as well. And politics <laughs> at work, politics at home. So the first thing is there's politics everywhere. Uh, there's politics in your office. There's politics in the environment in India. So you can't escape a political conversation. Uh, for us, it's important that we understand all the stakeholders in the country, uh, multiple different stakeholders. So I think a conversation uh, informs us what you'd like. And from our perspective, I think what's important is that we listen carefully. And we try and, of course, it, it's eventually going to be a compromise. We're not going to be able to do everything you tell us. But we have a sense of what uh, you're looking for what other stakeholders are looking for so we can get a positive solution you basically Without talking to the political system You will not be able to do what you're trying to achieve. It's impossible in India because the political system controls a hell of a lot of this country So I think that's uh, Thank but you so much to me to me. I Don't think that people listen enough. I think people uh, speak a lot tell their opinions but I don't think people listen. I think listening is a very powerful thing. So I intend to uh, listen. Thank you, sir. And, and, then, and then I think what's also very important is that when you say something, it's credible. So when you just come in and you say 50 different things and you end up doing nothing, that is not my style. So you might hear me saying two things, but I guarantee you if I'm saying two things here, it's going to be done. My name is Apramiya. I used to run Taxi for sure. Now I run Vocal. I'm also an angel investor. Uh, some of my companies which I invested in uh, have been getting notices uh, asking them to pay tax on the amount that has been invested by us. This is with the assumption that we haven't paid tax already. right? So that is almost assuming that I have evaded tax and treating me like a criminal through the eyes of the startup that I have invested in, right? Uh, so an honest tax paying citizen like me and so many others who are trying to, you know, invest in startups, uh, when, when will all of these people be treated with the respect that they deserve? Uh, you know, and how would you ensure it? Sir? I think I've been informed about the angel tax and I think angel tax goes counter to the philosophy of startups. Um, so I said I'll say one or two things here. We're going to get rid of this tax. Uh, when we come to power, we'll, we'll Thank strap you so it. Much. Thank you so much. And you can, you can call me on that one. <laughs> sure, sir. <laughs> so we will connect you to Abramaya. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to look at pretty much any big jump that India has taken 
ग्रीन रेवोल्यूशन वाइट रेवोल्यूशन लिबरलाइजेशन टेलीकॉम्स कंप्यूटर्स इट इज ऑलवेज अबाउट ब्रेकिंग अ मोनोपोली देर इज ऑलवेज इफ यू लुक केयरफुली यू विल ऑलवेज फाइंड दैट देर इज अ मोनोपोली दैट हैज बीन ब्रोकन दैट हैज रिजल्टेड इन इन द स्टेप चेंज एंड करंटली देर इज ए मैसिव मोनोपोली ऑन आवर बैंकिंग सिस्टम इफ यू लुक एट इफ यू लुक एट द नेम्स मिस्टर नीरव मोदी मिस्टर मेहुल चौकसी विजय माल्या अनिल अंबानी दीज नेम्स मिस्टर नीरव मोदी टेक्स थर्टी फाइव थाउजेंड करोड्स थर्टी फाइव थाउजेंड करोड्स दैट्स द इक्वेलेंट ऑफ वन ईयर्स ऑफ नारेगा मनी टेक्स इट रन अवे टू लंडन एंड वॉट इज ई गिव बैक how many jobs has mr nirav modi given this country almost nothing so our entire structure banking structure is captured and controlled by very very few limited numbers of people and i think one has to transform that one has to change that one has to make banking capital of course they have a place the biggest businesses have a place but they're not going to be producing the jobs the jobs are going to be produced by small and medium businesses by entrepreneurs this that's a fact you are if you look at job production it is it comes when small and medium businesses become big businesses and it comes from this type of ecosystem so opening up the banking system to entrepreneurs to small and medium businesses aggressively that's something that is fundamental uh, and i think the first part of his question is what programs do you wish to put forward that would help his community i think in terms of dalit entrepreneurship in terms of those that are socially well less well off and, uh, you know i mean do you mean social programs or you mean specific uh, entrepreneurship he is asking about specifically i mean i think helping them with the uh, banking system helping them with training systems helping them setting up hubs and connected areas where they can have easy access where they can come in uh um, you know and start their businesses easily connecting the skills of the country to the financial system to the governance system okay. if you want if you want look apart from everything that else that is going on you sense a anger in indian society you sense a um, tension in indian society in that tension and anger is there because india is failing on jobs and government doesn't like to say it but the fact of the matter is this country is dramatically disastrously failing on jobs okay and and we can keep making excuses we can keep saying that we are a super power and we are all this but india is simply not competitive when it comes to making jobs and this is something that india will have to first accept and after you accept it you can do something about it right you look at our entire conversation it is always about growth we grew 7% we grew 6% we grew whatever we did but nobody says this quarter this is how many jobs were added nobody is focusing on the critical metric of jobs and there is only one group of people who can solve this job problem and it is small and medium businesses and entrepreneurs now the second thing the second massive disconnect that we don't talk about there are traditional hubs of skill and you can see them all over karnataka you can see them all over india you know the names you know there's uh, kanpur in uttar pradesh there's bangalore as a tech hub there are multiple hubs of different different skills and we have an attitude where we don't really value them we don't think that the skills that are embedded uh, for example in in kanpur or in mirzapur i'm talking about up or in bangalore these skills are what is important so what we do is we don't link our system to those skills if you go if you look at if you look at the success of the chinese and i'm absolutely convinced that our single biggest challenge is to take them on and actually do better than them and i'm convinced we can do it what they have done at scale is they have taken their skill networks their traditional old skill networks and connected them to their financial network connected them to their infrastructure
So we have to think in terms of where are the skills, who are the people with skills, and breaking monopolies, and also making sure that we have a single-minded focus, that if we do not start to create the jobs that we need, we are sitting on a disaster, the size we cannot even comprehend. So I want to bring a sense of urgency here because we always like to talk about the successes and there are many successes, all of you are successful. But country the size of India, the scale of India simply needs to be producing jobs at a massive scale and we're failing there. Uh, when we say jobs, we say we're thinking about formal jobs. Okay? But the nature of India is that there are many 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 informal jobs and you cannot ignore those informal jobs and one of the things that I think has tremendously damaged this country is the notion that the current government has that the informal sector is uh, ineffective useless needs to be changed the informal sector is actually the backbone of India and the informal sector it really is and the informal structures um, sector needs to be transformed not with shock therapy gently but the informal sector also needs to be protected in that you can't just one day get up in the evening and say listen we're now going to detonate the entire informal sector by getting rid of the 500 and the thousand rupee note you just can't do that and you've literally wiped out over a crore jobs last year because of this type of policies. But newspapers don't write about this. Newspapers have their own reasons for not writing about this. But some of the policies that the government has carried out, demonetization, the way they've implemented GST, have been absolutely disastrous on jobs. Connecting the education system to the business ecosystem. Bridging, bridging the universities with business. There's no other way to do it. Uh, there's a, today our universities and even the best ones they are silos. They teach, they teach very well, but not connected networks. They are silos. So you can't, for example, access our universities and then have conversations about building businesses. You can't have that type of a, uh, a conversation. So a modern university, a 21st century university is a network. It's no longer a, a concrete silo. And so opening up these universities, uh, making sure that the right type of people are leading these universities, giving these universities independence. Frankly, the, the current dispensation is placing ideological people at the head of these universities. So there's no way, there's no way you're going to, you're going to do that. You're going to fix that problem. But turning, giving license to our university, basically trusting them. Okay. Saying, listen, we trust you, get on with it, we're not going to disturb you. Uh, get to work, talk to business people. That is a, the general approach of the government. The starting position is distrust. I don't trust you. So the first thing you've got to say is, okay, no, actually we're going we're gonna to trust you. We're going to go ahead and trust you and make a mistake, then we'll see. So the attitude requires a shift. But moving, moving uh, opening some of these, these structures. How do you create more entrepreneurs in the villages who can go on to create many jobs? I think... The jobs crisis that we have is a structural systemic crisis and it needs to be solved in a very, very fundamental way. And we believe that entrepreneurship and, and enabling youth to become entrepreneurial and what we call as mass entrepreneurs and creating more jobs is the key. So the question I have for you is I want, you, I want to visualize a young lady. So I represent the voice of around 10,000 youth across uh, 11 states that we work with. The, the point is there's a young lady, 21 years of age, who's completed a graduation in a village in Sindhanur Taluk in Raichur and she's saying where are the opportunities for me how do I go on to dream of the socio-economic status of an entrepreneur and how do I feel empowered enough to make those choices what's your thought for that girl out there and how what would you do to empower that young woman to go on to be an entrepreneur I mean first of all I think the entrepreneurs all over India I mean I go to poor you know, villages in Uttar Pradesh, some brilliant yes. work going on there, right? But the problem is not that the skills don't exist or the idea that a lot of people have is that, you know, we need to 
uh, skill people. Skills are there. There's no shortage of skills in India. You might need a fine tuning that you need to do to the skill to bring him into, into a corporate situation. But there's no, there's no limit to the skills that this country has. We don't actually utilize the skill. We don't actually give access to the skill. I'll give you, I'll give you a small example, right? Just off the, off the cuff. We think about vocational training. And we say, listen, uh, we are going to set up an ITI. And now we are going to train, let's say, carpenters. And so you have somebody training a whole bunch of carpenters. That's the current way of thinking about training. Well, there are millions of carpenters in this country. There's a network of carpenters in this country. They know how to do carpentry. Why don't you use them to train carpenters? Why don't you say to them that, listen, you understand how carpenters are trained. Go to every carpenter and say, listen, you please train three carpenters or five carpenters and then have a, um, a system of certification of a carpenters and say every time one of the carpenters you've trained gets certified, we give you 100 rupees in your bank account. You'll train unlimited number of carpenters. Point I'm making is that we, there are skills networks in this country, millions of millions of people who f absolutely understand what has to be done. But the system doesn't really reach out to them and say, okay, listen, you have this skill now, help us train. Have you ever heard, for example, the government of India saying to carpenters or uh, barbers, listen, we want you to now become an army of trainers. I've never heard it said. So there is a, there is a sense in our mind that skill is something that is centralized and that has to be handed out to people. No. There is skill all over this country, it's decentralized, it's operating right now. You have to, you have to link, you have to enable that guy. Right? And what is Bangalore? If you look at it, right, everybody says Bangalore is basically a particular type of skill that was built up over a long period of time and then that skill connected to the United States and the rest of the world. That's basically what has created modern Bangalore. So what we do with Bangalore, or what we did with Bangalore is what we have to do with other people, other hubs of skill. There is no, there is no reason. I mean, when you look at, for example, a, China, a, a town in China that produces 90% of the locks uh, that are being sold in the world, what they've essentially done is connected a traditional network of skills with money to the rest of the world and built the whole value chain. That's what we, we can do it easily. But we have to, we have to change our mindset to one of growth only. We've got to say, okay, now let's start producing millions and millions of jobs. How do you do that? You can't do it without the skills. So then the next step obviously is find the people, start building those connectivity, those, those networks and the thing builds fire. We've had successes, huh? For example, Bangalore is a huge success. If you, if, you look at, if you look at what everybody calls the white revolution, Amul, it is basically connecting a large number of women in a district of Gujarat called Anand, 70 years ago, that produced Anand and created, you know, made India number one milk producer. So when you reach out to the skills, it happens. But that's not our default position. In India, generally people don't respect skills. The starting position is they respect power, they don't respect skills. Everybody says, oh, you know, China's 10x hours, 20x hours. I don't believe that. Uh, we are fundamentally different in China. And you can't measure India the way you measure China. So I'm not in a, I'm not, I don't believe that China uh, is, you know, miles ahead of us or anything like that. What China has done pretty well is build manufacturing systems on skills and formalizing it. Okay? But India has tremend tremendous capacity, tremendous flexibility that China just does not have. So you can't, uh, you can't build a 60,000 man factory in India 
because of the nature of our democracy and the nature of our, of our ecosystem. But let me tell you, modern manufacturing is flexible manufacturing. Modern manufacturing is going to be small units uh, with a lot of high tech injected in them. That is perfect for India. So it is, it is being open to some of these ideas. Look, when you, when you close your mind, when you, when you have an environment which is angry, when you have an environment where there is tension, anger, uh, viciousness, you don't just close your mind. You close the entire ecosystem. Right? So what is happening today is India's liberal nature, India's open system, India's institutions are being attacked. They are being suppressed. So for us, you have to be, you have to have an open, open ecosystem. People have to be ready to talk. People have to be ready to converse. Right? That's, for us, that's the first step. With a, with a bad environment, you're going nowhere. On the, on the specifics, uh, manufacturing, you got to build the basic infrastructure. You got to build roads. You got to build the architecture that allows goods to be moved about. GST in a, in a proper form is, 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 a, is a good way forward. So some of those things are happening. Got it. Okay, so we have a question on women's entrepreneurship from uh, Kajal Upadhyay. Is she here? Kajal? Ah, she's right here. Kajal? Question? Hi, Hello. I'm Kajal. From, I'm an entrepreneur myself. Uh, but my question is very different. It is not about entrepreneurship as such. It is about, I just want to know why is everybody going around saying Chokida Chor hai? I don't know. I mean, look, I'll tell you how I see it. Apparently now the whole country is a Chokida. That's what I last heard. Everybody has become a chokidar. But, but let me tell you the facts. Okay? And I'll go into a little bit of detail because it's important. The Rafael contract is the biggest defense contract in the world. It's the biggest defense contract in the world. It was negotiated by the UPA. Eight years of negotiation. It's a very technical contract, eight years of negotiation, and a couple of things were decided. 526 crores for one aircraft. The aircraft to be manufactured in India, frankly, in Karnataka, right here, with, by HAL. And, and when, you say, when you say, how do you think about competing in manufacturing? Well, one way you compete in manufacturing is get one of the most high-tech products being created on the planet, put it in Bangalore, and then help or build all the ancillaries around it. That's how you do it, right? It was going to be built by HAL. Now, we changed governments. Mr. Narendra Modi become, becomes Prime Minister, and you can check this. He goes to France with Mr. Anil Ambani on his delegation. It's a fact, government records, check. The contract is changed. The defense minister turns around and says, I have no idea how this happened. He's at a fish market in Goa. He says, I have no idea how this ha happened. What we subsequently find is that the 526 crore aircraft has become a 1600 crore aircraft. So 126 aircraft were to be bought, now 36 aircraft are going to be bought, but we're going to pay the same price. And Mr. Anil Ambani suddenly edges into the contract. Now, we're talking about skill here. Mr. Anil Ambani got the world's biggest defense contract. He's never built an aircraft in his life, ever. The company, the company that got the contract, we're talking merit here. The company that got the contract was formed 10 days before the contract was given. The French president publicly states that I was in India. I was told by the Prime Minister of India that the only way 
Dassault is going to get this contract as if Mr. Anil Ambani is given the contract. And oh, by the way, don't pay 500, don't charge 526 crores, charge 1600 crores. Mr. The President of France says this. And you can check the internet, it's there. We raised the issue, I asked these four questions to the Prime Minister and Parliament House. Why did you give Anil Ambadi the contract? Why 1600 crores? What is Mr. Anil Ambani's experience? Mr. Prime Minister doesn't answer. One and a half hours. He looks down, looks up, looks left, looks right, doesn't answer, doesn't look into people's eyes. And it's a fact. Please look at the, please look at the tape. He's standing there going like this, like this, like this, like this. He's not answering the questions. Okay. The CBI chief turns around and says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to investigate. Remember one thing. The Prime Minister placed that man there. The CBI chief is removed, sacked. The Supreme Court comes in and says, bring him back. He's brought back. He's sacked again. Within a matter of hours. Now, defense ministry documents have come in the Hindi, Hindu newspaper. Take a look at them. There is a series of articles, three or four articles, it is the negotiating team writing in the documents. And the negotiating team is saying, Mr. Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, has carried out a parallel negotiation with Rafael, with Dassault. It's the negotiating team. The negotiating team is saying, the Prime Minister of India has pushed us aside. And the PMO is directly negotiating with the government of France and Dassault. Now, all we said was, let's have an inquiry. Let's have a joint parliamentary committee. Let's check out what happened. And the gentleman who says, I am the Chaukidar here, whose name has come in the defense ministry papers, the defense minister said, I don't know anything about this. The CBI chief has been sacked. That gentleman turns around and says, no inquiry, no JPC, nothing. Look, it's a simple thing. Mr. Anil Ambani was given 30,000 crores by Mr. Narendra Modi. It's as simple as that. And the case is open and shut because even those documents, even those documents that are saying the Prime Minister is running a parallel negotiation, if those documents become part of an inquiry, Mr. Narendra Modi and Mr. Anil Ambani are going to jail. It's as simple as that. Now, my point is, if the Prime Minister wasn't guilty, he would immediately say, absolutely, let's do an inquiry. 100% an inquiry should be done. This is the biggest defense contract. It's Air Force money. I'm the Prime Minister of India. I have done nothing wrong. Have an inquiry. Why is he not having an inquiry? Simple. Now, my friends in the media, these days, they're pressurized, they're controlled. So they don't really like to talk about these things. And I can give you a list of defense contracts that Mr. Anil Ambani and Mr. Modi's friends have been given. One after the other. And they've only got caught on Rafael, which happens to be the biggest contract in the world. So that's why everybody is saying, Chokidar Chor Hai. Now look, they, they attacked the Congress party. They attacked the Congress party on corruption. And we took action on corruption. We sacked people. So, fairness requires, fairness requires that when so blatantly, so publicly it is being said that corruption has taken place, if the Prime Minister wasn't guilty, he should have said, listen, I'm investigating this thing. The people who are responsible for this thing are going to jail. That's what he would have done. Why is he not doing that? You want to say something? By the way, another thing. Why does the Prime Minister not have conversations like this? Yeah, say, say. I'm happy to. I'm happy to answer whatever you want. Yeah. Um. 
Hello, Mr. Rahul. My name is Aditya. And uh, in reference to the explanation that you gave, I want to tell you that a common Indian is stuck in a situation where the mainstream political parties who rule once and then switch parties, some one party is accused of one scam and the other is accused That's of true. many more. That, that's absolutely true. So, and and yeah, go, ahead, go ahead. So at the end of the day, these are accusations. The opposition and other members unitedly took the Rafael deal to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said no. No, that's not that's not what happened. It's been no, 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 no. That's not what happened. One second. Let's be clear about what happened. The Supreme Court said, it is not our jurisdiction to decide on these matters. It is the jurisdiction of the political class. Yes. The Supreme Court said do a JPC. Right? That's not what happened. So it is, it is absolutely wrong to say that the Supreme Court said there should be no inquiry. It did not say that. Mm -hmm. One second. After that, documents were handed to the Supreme Court through the Hindu, which clearly state defense ministry documents that Mr. Narendra Modi yeah, we'll, we'll come to you. That, no, no, let him, let him be. That Mr. Narendra Modi personally negotiated the Dassault contract. That's criminal. By any measure that is criminal, he should go to jail for that. It's simple. There's no, there's no confusion there. It's black and white, open and shut. What Mr. Gandhi, if I may... Yeah. Uh, impose the prerogative of the moderator to get the topic back on sorry. entrepreneurship. That would be great because we've got a few other I'm questions. I'm sorry I went long enough. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I can see in the political environment, you know, it's a passionate uh, thing, but I would like a few of our entrepreneurs. Anvita is there. If she could ask a question about uh, women's entrepreneurship and rural entrepreneurship. Anvita, are you here? And then I'll, I'll get a few more questions in. We'll, we'll try and keep these quick, please, because we're uh, running short on time. <laughs> Mine more about rural entrepreneurship. The question is, what kind of policy interventions do you think would help better align rural entrepreneurs with the urban consumer, urban demand, and kind of help bridge the gap between rural and the urban sector? I mean, I think, I think just making the an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is somebody who's trying to use his, utilize his skills to build a business. I, I think they're, you know, in India today. People are moving rural, urban, and these systems one are very connected. So one, one, one. I think looking at it purely and saying this is a rural entrepreneur, this is an urban entrepreneur is in, in itself a, a slight problem. But if you're looking at the rural area, then connecting the rural area to the city, transforming uh, how our railway network works, trans allowing rural people to move fast across India. Uh, making sure that, again, the type of skills that they require, uh, the type of information that they need, the, you know, what I, what I spoke about, giving them training, giving them, introducing them to people who have built businesses like yourselves, bringing them into a conversation with the ecosystem, that, that type of stuff would help. And then, of course, in government contracts and in other uh, spaces, helping them a little bit, saying, look, you're, you're sort of, uh, struggling against all odds, so we will create little spaces for you to sell your products, etc. First of all, I want to thank you uh, for what you're doing for the country. Each one of you, in your own way, are working very, very hard and trying to make this country successful. So I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you're doing. I understand that you struggle. I understand that you face an uphill battle. And my doors are open for you in any way I can help you. I don't promise you that I'll resolve everything you know, that you bring to me, but I will, my intention will be there to try and help you. I think as far as India is concerned, uh, we're on a very positive track. There are very, very powerful things that this country has. Uh, its people, its nature, the way uh, we deal with each other, uh, our technical capabilities. So there is, I'm pretty optimistic. The only thing I would like to say is that a country which is divided, a country which is angry, a country which is fighting within itself is not going to be successful. So you have to do your little bit so that this country calms down, 
doesn't sort of have this sort of very angry angry feeling to it and we get back you know happily where we were and we move on thank you very much for coming thank you mr gandhi and i really loved the way the whole the policies the data was communicated through rahul gandhi uh, i'm i'm i want to be you know i had been politically neutral so far but yeah this gives a a little bit a good opinion about rahul gandhi even though after there is a lot of negative media about rahul gandhi but lot of stuff but yeah uh, he's a, sort of a gentleman you can say uh, thank you